Christ be with you. My name is Tommy Waldup, and I'm one of the members here, and I'm proud to welcome you to the First United Methodist Church of Mayfield. We're so glad you joined us, and we invite you to join us back again. Um, if you, as you came in, you should have received a bulletin. There is a tariff portion in that bulletin. Feel free to fill it out. Provide us with as much information as you feel comfortable, including whether or not you're going to attend the Wednesday night meal. But we can plan for you for that. Um, anything that you feel comfortable, including a prayer request, feel free to submit a prayer request. Speaking of prayer, one of the new traditions that we have adopted here is that we're going to pray for a church, a different church, around the district every Sunday morning. Uh, this morning we've selected the Bandana United Methodist Church. Bob Kane is the pastor there. And if you will bow with me, we'll pray for them now. Father God, we love you. And we give you glory and honor for all that you're doing in our lives and in the lives of those at Bandana, Bandana Methodist. Shine your light to them, through them, over them, May they make a difference in this world for your glory and for your purposes. Fill them with the power of your Holy Spirit. Fill us all with your joy, your wisdom, with your constant reminders that your presence will go with each of us. In your name we pray. Amen. So back to the bulletin. If you'll grab a bulletin and go through the announcements. There's lots of announcements there. A lot of things to participate in, to mark, to uh, pray for. Uh, as a point of personal privilege, I would like to point out and remind everyone that missions meeting, which is a week from tomorrow night, 6.30 here in the church, um, this is going to be more about the overall missions, goals, and ministry of this church. Uh, we're going to try to put an umbrella organization together so that we can keep tabs of what each group is doing, uh, see if there are holes in our missions, uh, efforts that need to be filled, see if we're duplicating efforts in certain ways, and, 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 and just look at where each and every one of us can do missions here in, in our community. Next Monday night, a week from tomorrow night, 6.30, look forward to seeing you there. Uh, we, Realm was pretty active this week, so we have several people we want to keep in our prayers today. Uh, Shirley Goff, who is Larky's uh, sister. Jamie Lee is home, understand hope, and doing well. Hope's here um, David Stone, who's Kim's ne nephew-in-law, I think went home from the hospital, the last I heard, and doing well, doing better. And then, of course, our dear uh, Carolyn Cantor. Want to keep them in our prayers. So uh, let's keep all these folks in our prayers and let's pray corporately and together, and the words will be on the screen. O gracious and holy God, give us diligence to see you, wisdom to perceive you, and patience to wait for you. Grant us, O God, a mind to meditate on you. Eyes to behold you, ears to listen for your word, a heart to love you, and a life to proclaim you, through the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The scripture reading this morning is from the book of Jeremiah, 31st chapter 27 through 34 verses. Be ready, the time's coming, God's decree. When I will plant people and animals in Israel and Judah, just as a farmer plants seed. And in the same way that earlier, that earlier I relentlessly pulled up and tore down and took apart and demolished. So now I am sticking with them as they start all over, building and planting. When that time comes, you won't hear the old proverb anymore, parents ate the green apples. Their children got the stomach ache. No, no. Each person will pay for his own sin. You will eat green apples, and you're the one who gets sick. That's right. The time is coming when I make brand new covenant with Israel and Judah. It won't be a repeal of the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took their hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. 
They broke that covenant even though I did my part as their master. God's decree. This is the brand new covenant that I will make with Israel when the time comes. I will put my law within them, write it on their hearts, and be their God. And they will be my people. They will no longer go around setting up schools to teach each other about God. They'll know me firsthand. The dull and the bright, the smart and the slow, I'll wipe the, clean, the slate clean for each of them. I'll forget they ever sinned. God's decree. Now if you'll join with me together in the affirmation of faith, which is in, on page 883 of your hymnal, if you prefer. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is created, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge, our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God.
in Walmart and you turn around and your mom's gone. No? You've gotten lost in Walmart before? It doesn't feel very good to be lost, does it? Did you know that sometimes you can get lost not just like physically where you can't find where you're going, but sometimes you just don't know the right or wrong thing to do and you get lost? Well, there's a book that can be your guide. Can you guess what that book is? No? Have you ever heard of the Bible? Yeah. Yeah. So, the Bible is God's Word, and it can lead you in life. The Bible is filled with God's Word to help us know in our lives how to be like Christ. Psalms 119 says, Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. When it's dark outside, does it help if you have lights on your sidewalk or on the way to the driveway? Yeah, it helps you lead. So, that's what the Bible can do in your life. We all pray with me. Hey God, we thank you for giving us the Bible to guide our way through life. Help us to remember that we can always depend on the Bible to point us in the right direction. We love you so, so much. Amen.
please be seated. As you're finding the seats and the ushers are making their way to the front, it's a chance for me to remind you, first of all, welcome. We're glad you're here today. If you're visiting with us from another congregation and you have a tithe agreement with that congregation, it's my bound duty to remind you that it belongs there, your tithe. Hold on to it. Take it home with you. Make sure it gets to the place that you promised it would go. If you have made a promise to Mayfield First United Methodist Church in that wise, then you may do so now. This is a great chance for you to exercise the promise that you've made. If you don't have a tithe agreement, you haven't made a covenant to place your money in any particular place, and you simply want to give a gift, that's something that we will honor. We will take that gift and we will use it for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And remember that not every gift fits into an offering plate. There may be some moment in your day that God is asking you to give over, some resource in your life, some skill or ability that God is asking you to use. Whatever it is, give that to God now. And as we are transformed, let the world be transformed by the work that God does through us. Let us pray. And now, O Lord, we ask your blessing upon the gift and the giver. Let our faithfulness be echoed by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And let our faithfulness echo his in the world as we seek to transform it, to bring about the kingdom of heaven. For the sake of his name, amen.
find your seats. We have one more passage of scripture to read for this service of worship from the Gospel according to St. Luke, the 18th chapter, verses 1 through 8. We'll read this together. Let these words resound, not only within the sanctuary, but within your hearts. Jesus told them a story showing that it was necessary for them to pray consistently and never quit. He said, There was once a judge in some city who never gave God a thought and cared nothing for people. A widow in that city kept after him. My rights are being violated. Protect me. He never gave her the time of day. But after this went on and on, he said to himself, I care nothing what God thinks, even less what people think. But because this widow won't quit badgering me, I'd better do something and see that she gets justice. Otherwise, I'm going to end up beaten black and blue by her pounding. Then the master said, Do you hear what that judge, corrupt as he is, is saying? So what makes you think God won't step in and work justice for his chosen people who continue to cry out for help? Won't he stick up for them? I assure you, he will. He will not drag his feet. But how much of that kind of persistent faith will the Son of Man find on the earth when he returns? Hmm. This is the word of God for you who are the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. And now, Lord, we ask your blessing upon the hearing and the reading of the word. Let it find its way into our hearts. Let it be written there. And let our ways become your ways. Let your ways become our ways. May they be one for the sake of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Amen. I am a Garfield fan. I was converted to Garfield. I was for a very long time a, a fan of several other cartoons, but uh, Garfield really started to get into my head after I met my wife. As it turns out, when we started keeping house together, she had books of the Garfield comics. And once I got started, I couldn't stop. It was fantastic stuff. Prior to this conversion experience that I had, the only real memory I have of Garfield is a comic that I actually kept taped in my locker. I wasn't a fan of Garfield, but I loved this Garfield comic. He's sitting there with books tied to his arms and one tied to his head. And he says something like, I'm learning by osmosis. He's just waiting for the, the words to come out of the book and enter into his mind and take up residence there. And I don't mind telling you, that's kind of how I lived my life in high school. You know, that was part of what I was thinking. Maybe if I just hold these books long enough, it'll get into my brain. But you know and I know that that's not how it works. Even in a comic strip, a cat like Garfield is going to have to break down, open up the book, and read. Sooner or later, that's how the world works. Cats got to read if they're going to understand what's in the book. That brings us to today's message. The Jeremiah passage is one of my life verses. Jeremiah speaking to the truth of what is to come. The fact that when Jesus Christ comes among us and teaches us how to live scripture, that it will be written upon our hearts, that the way we move and act and live and breathe will be controlled in many ways by the things that God has been trying to teach God's people through teachers, through faithful prophets, through witnesses. But when we see Jesus, we finally start to understand what it looks like when it's truly lived out. Not the rule keeping, not the folks who try to do everything that they can to memorize scripture and then live it according to the law like it's a rule book of sorts. But living it the way Jesus lived it as a book of instruction. A book, a guide, a manual that takes you on a journey of life change. That asks you to consider what your most important values are. But there's a process to the Garfields of the world, to the Garfields of Mayfield First, to the Garfields 
wherever they are, listening to the sound of my voice, I want to encourage you that you've got to do more than just carry that thing around, your Bible. You have to have some interaction with it. And I think it's fairly simple to say. The first thing that you have to do is read. You have to be willing to open it up and read it. Now, for some people, reading Scripture means that you have to sit down with it. You have to have a candle. You have to be in a certain place, maybe something that smells nice. You have to have the right stationery. Yes and no. Those things can be helpful, but you don't have to have them. What you have to have is a mind willing to look at what the Word says. I learned some valuable lessons when I was at Lambeth from a couple of my professors. <laughs> lessons that weren't on the test. Not the test that they gave out, but the test that we all experience every day, the test called life. One of the things that I was taught was that you have to take the word at its face value, but you also have to be willing to dig into the context. There are things that scripture will say to us from time to time, and we look at it and we think we know exactly what it's about until we remember that this was written thousands of years ago. And it was not necessarily written to us. It was written for us. That's what the passage says today. All scripture, God breathed, useful for teaching. But we have to recognize the context. And that leads us to the second point of the sermon. If you're going to read it and you're going to spend time with it every day, and not just reading a verse or two at a time, but reading passages, allowing it to shape and form your thinking, you have to be willing to at least try to understand. My most frequent complaint, the complaint that I hear most often, if I were keeping track of this, and I may or may not be, the complaint that I hear most often about Bible study is I'll read and I'll read and then I'll have to go back and reread what I just read because I don't know what I just read. If this is you, you can stick up a spiritual hand. No need to make confession in front of all God's children today. But if you find yourself reading passages in that way and then getting to the end of the passage or the page or the chapter or whatever and not knowing what it is that you've read, have you truly read the scriptures? Have you allowed that word to get inside your heart? Now here's the thing. If you, like me, have trouble with that, that's okay. There are other ways to get the scripture inside your heart. We all have an experience of reading stories to children, do we not? At least we've seen it done. I've had the privilege of reading to small children in classrooms, and boy, let me tell you what. <laughs> Hearing them giggle and laugh when you read the story the way it's meant to be read, doing the voices and all that good stuff, that's a joy. If you've not experienced it, I encourage it. Because you don't even have to be good at the voices. Kids just love that you're passionate enough about what you're reading. <laughs> that's what they take in. They take in your passion for reading. My parents taught me to be a reader, to be someone who enjoys books by sharing their passion for what it was that they found in the printed page that made a difference in their lives. So if you're having trouble getting passionate about what you're reading in scripture because maybe the language is difficult for you, there are other versions that we can look at. And yes, I know everybody thinks that you have to have the exact right version. I'm here to tell you, none of us, none of us are willing to read scripture in the original Greek or the Old Testament in Hebrew. So if you want to talk about the language that's best, we're going to have to make do with the one that we've got. For most of us, that's English. If we're going to look at the English translations of Scripture, then we ought to find one that speaks to us, that has a degree of accuracy, and one that allows us to take in more Scripture. What I'm saying to you is this. If you've got the exact translation, the perfect translation that all the scholars and your grandparents agree is the right one, and you're reading it and you're not getting anything out of it, don't you think I'm going to encourage you to find one that's maybe not as well accepted by the scholars so that you get even more out of what you're reading? I'm willing to make that trade-off and eventually get you to the point where you can read some of the harder things and read some of the translations that are more difficult. And then bring you in on a Wednesday night sometime 
and shower you with Greek words and Hebrew phrases, just as many as your mind will take in. Because as we're reading this, our understanding has to be opened up. Otherwise, we're just taking in words and we're walking them down the street and we're not doing anything with them. Just mindless droning and repetition or pointing to them as rules so that we can slug our neighbor. That's not nice. We ought not to do that. Part of our understanding comes from this. You have to look at what you're reading and understand it for what it is. I said a moment ago that scripture was not necessarily written to us, but it was certainly written for us. That means when we're reading somebody else's mail, when we're reading the letters that were sent to churches that aren't here, we have to recognize that. We have to see that and understand their context and compare it to our own. That understanding part is vital for us. I don't want anyone to walk out of here thinking that if you don't do that, you can't enjoy scripture, you can't learn from it, you can't hear God's plan for your life in it. But I'm telling you, it gets easier and easier as you take those extra steps to find out what it was that God was saying in those original moments to those original recipients of that message. When we understand that, we can then compare it to what's going on in our own lives and see that we have a lot more in common with them than we might think. But if you don't realize what it is you're reading, you might make a mistake in thinking that what their context is is exactly what our context is. It's like this, if you're reading fairy tales and you come to the story of Hansel and Gretel, if you're not reading that carefully and understanding exactly what it is, you might think that that's a book about architecture or maybe a cookbook, it's hard to tell. And if you're not reading carefully at all, you might get confused about whether or not it's a baking manual or how to cook children. So listen closely, kids. When you're reading, pay attention to what it is that you're seeing on the page. Because how you read a recipe is different than how you read a poem. And that's different from how you read a biography. Those things that are in scripture, they kind of all blend together in our minds, but they actually have some very distinct shapes and forms. And if this is the first time you're hearing about this, after having read scripture for 40, 50, 60, 70 years, you're in for a treat. Because once you go back and read these things according to their context, and in the shape and form that they have, you start to see that there's more to what you're reading than what you've been told all these years. Scripture is God-breathed. It's inspired. And that means that we have every reason to trust in it. Which brings us to our third point. You can't just read it and understand it and be done with it. Because that makes you a scholar. Good for you. Congratulations. We need more scholars in the world today. People who are willing to take on those tough tasks of understanding and explaining things to others. But if you stop there and you're just a scholar, you've not taken the step to be a believer. Believers read what they have seen in Scripture and know that it is true for them. It has everything to do with what you're going to do next. It speaks to the heart and the core of who you are. And as we seek to grow nearer in our relationship with God, to grow nearer to one another in our relationships within the church, that belief is what drives us. Sometimes people skip straight to the belief. And they don't necessarily have the understanding that goes ahead of that belief. That's okay. I was told once that someone uh, who was bringing a child to be baptized had some reservations because they said, I'm not sure that my child understands what's going on. And I, I thought politely said, well, just so you know, I've been doing this for about 20 years and I'm not sure I understand all of it myself. And I do it for a living. We don't fully understand. That's where belief comes in. That's where faith has to be a part of what we do. If we treated all of our rites and rituals in the church with that clear measure of knowing and understanding what's going on, we'd never get anything done. I'd still be in premarital counseling because that day when we got married, we had no idea what we were getting into. I've told you before, Lorinda walks by a picture of us on our wedding day and she looks at it and she just shakes her head and she says, somebody should have stopped those babies. <laughs> they had no idea what they were doing. Then she turns and looks at me with those loving eyes and says, I still love you. If we only knew what we were getting into, but we don't. And we never truly 
fully will. That's where belief becomes so important. And your belief is not just, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, that willingness to clap your hands and make the fairy come back to life. You remember that? It's got more to do with what are you willing to do about it? How deeply are you willing to commit to it, to these principles, to these ideas? And now you begin to see why it's so important that we read it and understand it before we believe in it, or at least as we believe in it. Because if you've got the belief, but your belief is not pinned down to something that Scripture gives us as God breathed, if you've got something that you have believed in that is a pretty new idea, say something from the middle of the 1800s, and you think that it goes all the way back to Jesus, that might be a moment for you to stop and reconsider what it is that you believe in. A lot of our families have giant family Bibles, look a lot like the one that's on our communion table. It's a place where you can write down births and deaths and record marriages and great days in the life of your family. A lot of the family Bibles in this part of the world have Schofield on them somewhere. Have you seen or heard this? I'll just tell you this and then we'll move on. The Schofield Bible introduced some concepts in the middle 1800s that have become a part of the fabric of Christianity today. Now, these ideas don't go all the way back to antiquity. In fact, if you had told this to a first or second century Christian, they would have told you that what you're saying is heresy. Some of these things are considered to be heretical by the early church. A heresy is something that is not in keeping with what has been revealed to us by God through Scripture or through the teachings of Jesus Christ, through the best traditions of the church. And when you come down to it, these Schofield sayings, some of these ideas, like the rapture, for example, if you get to those and you hold on to those, you're holding on to something that's brand new relatively speaking. So it's worth going back and reading up on it. It's worth going into Scripture, diving through, and really putting your mind to it, and not just taking what somebody has told you with great passion and zeal and fervor. Because when you get those ideas into your head, those beliefs into your head because of someone else's emotional response to it, your own emotions can kick in and cause you to believe things that you shouldn't, things that are misleading, things that mischaracterize the nature of Jesus Christ himself. So your beliefs, while they're vital, while they're definitely important because of who we are, we make a statement of our beliefs every Sunday. We affirm our faith, that in which we believe. But if you hold on to something because it's your firm belief and you're not sure that that belief is founded in Scripture, Take the time to read up on it. Take the time to ask some questions. Find some folks who have done that homework already and see what their answers were. And then see if you can duplicate those answers for yourself in your own Bible study. That brings us to the last of these four components. You have to read it. You have to understand it. You have to believe it. You have to be willing to bet your life on it. And then finally, you might not live it. You might want to live it. You might want to take what you've learned, take what you have committed yourself to by your words, by your presence, and do something with it. To live those lifestyle choices that Jesus showed us we should live. To care for the poor. To take care of those who cannot and sometimes won't take care of themselves. To offer to the people around us not just a kind word, but a kind heart. To extend the hand of friendship in ways that go well beyond what our comfort zone might dictate. What does it mean to believe? I was talking with a group of folks who are, well, let me just say it this way, they're not believers, they're not Christians. And they were asking me questions and they were kind of digging and poking. And one of them asked me a question that I kind of asked a few times myself. He looked at me and he said, how come you Christians take the scriptures literally until you get to that part where Jesus says, go and sell everything you have and give the money to the poor? How does that work? And I said, well, it, it doesn't work very well. That's really one of those things that we're still working on and have been for quite some time. It stopped him in his tracks. He said, wait a minute. 
You mean to tell me that you're acknowledging that that's a problem? And I said, absolutely. The way we read scripture sometimes doesn't make any sense. We choose the parts that we want to take literally, and then we say the rest of it's metaphor. When obviously it's metaphor on the page from the get-go. Jesus has plans for our lives. Jesus has a way that we are supposed to live. It's the plan that God came up with from the beginning that we've been getting wrong ever since. But Jesus is the example, the one who finally comes to reveal what it looks like when we do it correctly, when we're doing things right. Jesus spoke harshly to those who were mere rule keepers. Jesus spoke harshly to those who were selfish. Jesus spoke harshly to the institutionalized people of God for doing things the way they've always been done. And Jesus was crucified for speaking out when the political machinery of his day wasn't doing things the way God wanted them to. And when Jesus spoke out, he wasn't just taking a risk on maybe not being liked on social media anymore. He was risking his life. He was putting himself in front of that political machine. And he was saying to those people, this is not the way that it ought to be. The way you're doing it is wrong. And when he finally did that, that's when the political machinery ate him, tried to destroy him, put him to death. But Jesus had a surprise. God had a surprise. After that willingness to put his life on the line and having his life taken from him, God gave it back to him. It's a lesson for all of us that standing up for what is right is more important than being safe in this world. Standing up for what you believe in is more important than the consideration of the people around you. And he also exemplifies this understanding that if you're following God, then sometimes the traditions get left behind as well. Jesus was notorious among the leaders of the Jewish faith for taking his disciples out on the Sabbath, breaking stalks of grain, eating them, healing on the Sabbath, offering wisdom and comfort to people who were obviously outsiders. And Jesus took a hit for that. Bless you. But the greatest hit that he took was for standing up and saying, this is how God's going to do it. This is the way things actually work. And when the power structures of the world heard about that and realized that they were in danger, we start to see how difficult it is to be a student of Jesus Christ. It's not easy at all. It requires risk. It requires dedication. A lot of people have been brought to the altar by passionate sermons that basically indicate that all you have to do is give it over to Jesus. That's true. That's how sin goes out of our lives because there's not a thing that we can do to make this happen. This is not a transactional kind of lifestyle. You're not going to be good so you get to go to heaven. You're going to be good because you're going to heaven. Because you've made that deal with Jesus to give yourself completely and Jesus did all the heavy lifting but there's a reason they were called disciples that comes from the Latin discipuli it means a learner a student it means someone who's willing to sit at the feet of the one who is teaching and to transform their lives by what they take in perhaps by what they read what they understand what they then choose and commit themselves to believe and then what they if they're doing it right go on to live in their everyday lives. You see, folks, it's not about saying, yes, I believe in Jesus, slapping on your name tag and being a part of the club forever and ever, amen. It means take up your cross and follow him. It means sit down at the feet of the master and listen to the hard teaching. Even when, like Peter, we have to hear words that sound like this, get behind me, Satan. Can you imagine a teacher turning to you and calling you a name like that? But what if the teacher was doing that to demonstrate that what you're doing was the exact opposite of what you were supposed to be doing? How many times, <laughs> Bill can probably attest to this, how many times have we had to grab someone's hand in a teaching moment because they were about to grab the wrong end of the saw? How many times have we had to take away the power tool because somebody was about to nail themselves to the workbench. 
How many times have we had to offer harsh, constructive criticism because the route that was being chosen was one that was going to lead directly to that cliff at the end of the lane? To be a disciple of Jesus means that this has to be more than dead ink on a page. It means it has to be a living word. And if we reverence the written scripture above the living word, that is Jesus Christ and the example that he gave to us, we're going to find ourselves sitting in the dust, watching the world go by. God has a plan. God has a logic. The things that God wants in this world make sense. They don't make sense to the world because it's a reversal of what the world wants. I want to be powerful, I want to have money, I want to be in charge. And Jesus says, you've almost got it, just turn it over. I want to give up my power, I want to give away my money, and I want to serve. If you're willing to participate in that great reversal, then you've read scripture and you've seen how Jesus did it. That's exactly what he was about. And that's the life that he calls each of us to today. Is it going to be dead ink or will this word come to life? in you this day. Let us pray. Lord, it's not fun to hear this kind of stuff. Why, this might not even be what we signed up for. We want to be comforted, and we can be. We want to be loved on, and we, and we should be. But then, once we have recovered, once our broken places have been made whole, you call us to the difficult path, the one where we go back down through the dark places and we find others who were where we were, who are where we were. Bring the ink to life, God, within us so that we may be the body of Christ, even Jesus, the living word. We ask it for the sake of his name. Amen. All right, I understand. That's probably not the most attractive way to say, hey, come on down and be a follower of Jesus, because it does get difficult. But I wanted to be honest with you. It's not easy to be a Christ follower. Ask someone who lived in the first, second, or third centuries when it was illegal to follow Jesus. Ask someone who lives in third world countries even today, places, well, like even in China, where churches are being closed down daily and Christians are being put to death. If it were easy, everybody would be doing it and doing it well. It's not. But if you're still willing to make that commitment, I'm willing to walk that journey with you. And so too are the people who are sitting around you. It's what the body of Christ does. If you've done that before, if you've made that commitment to Jesus before and you've realized that you kind of only said the words and slapped on the name tag, but now you're ready to go past reading and understanding and believing to living, come forward and say so. Meet me here. And if you're part of another congregation and you're ready to be a part of the body of Christ that meets in this building, that is deployed to work in the world from this place, come meet me here. Everybody else, you've got the entirety of the chancel rail. Come and kneel and pray as God leads you to pray. Listen as God leads you while you pray. We'll sing a song while we do this. And if we need to, we'll sing a little bit longer. But take whatever time you need to make the commitment that God is asking of you today.
gladly take my station there. What's your post? What's your station? Where's God calling you to be? And where in those moments of prayer do you return to again and again? Over the next few months, we're going to start emphasizing prayer even more than we already have. We're going to bring back the prayer stations, and we're going to start them next week. You'll see in the handouts and the material that there's some things that we need to do as we pray to listen more and not just to deliver our laundry list of expectations to God, but to be open to where God is leading us in the world today. We'll be praying for our church. We'll be praying for our community. And we'll be praying that we are getting ready for Christmas. Yes, I said it. We're getting ready for Christmas that go well beyond just decorating for the season. But instead, we're including the idea of what would it look like to prepare our sanctuary to receive guests throughout the Christmas season. Start praying now. Be the rush. In the meantime, as we look over Nazareth at sunrise, take a look at the words of the benediction. Some of you have it memorized. Let these words send you forward in the world. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Go serve your neighbor and read those Bibles. Amen.